that's the problem. And I think that's the fundamental problem is that local democracy has failed. I mean, that's what the LA Alliance case was all about is that put grants pass aside, local democracy has failed to solve this homelessness problem on a constitutional level. Welcome to Manhattan Insights, a Manhattan Institute production. My name is Stephen Ide. I'll be guest hosting today's episode. I'm a senior fellow here at the Manhattan Institute. The topic of today's episode is homelessness at the Supreme Court. A couple of weeks ago, the U.S. Supreme Court agreed to take up a decision called Johnson versus Grants Pass. Grants Pass is a small city in southwestern Oregon that had a few local laws on its books pertaining to activities such as camping in public parks that it was using to reduce street homelessness encampments um, in its community. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is headquartered out of San Francisco, struck down these laws as an unconstitutional violation of the Eighth Amendment's prohibition on cruel and unusual punishments. Um, this decision resembled a similar decision called Martin v. Boise that the Ninth Circuit had handed down back in 2018, um, also related to quality of life ordinances, homeless encampments. Um, Boise, Idaho petitioned the U.S. Supreme Court back in late 2019 to take up that case. That time around, the high court passed. This time around, the high court decided that it would be taking up this case. So just to highlight the importance of this development that the Supreme Court will be taking on homelessness this term, um, there really has not been a major Supreme Court case about homelessness since the modern homelessness crisis began in the early 1980s. You have to look way back decades ago to find something even related to the issue of homelessness that the Supreme Court has taken up. So this is a very high profile decision. Um, I'm personally expecting it to be um, one of the highest profile decisions of this term. It's also a very complicated issue um, involving what it means to respond to homelessness, what kind of mix of law enforcement versus social housing programs is appropriate, what type of housing is you need to offer, permanent versus temporary housing, um, how much deference the courts should be giving to local authorities, um, and also just what type of degree of oversight is appropriate. That the judiciary should be extended over local issues and social policy questions. To disentangle um, these and related matters, I have a terrific guest with me today. Her name is Liz Mitchell. She's really one of the major authorities, I would say, in the nation on homelessness law. Uh, Liz is based in L.A. She is a uh, partner with the litigation firm of Umhofer, Mitchell and & King, and she's been the lead attorney for a really important organization called the L.A. Alliance for Human Rights that's been involved in a lot of uh, litigation with the city and county of Los Angeles. But before I go any deeper into trying to introduce you, Liz, why don't I just let you introduce yourself, um, talk about your background, how you got into this issue, and what the L.A. Alliance for Human Rights is and what it's been up to. Sure. Thank you for giving me the opportunity and the wonderful introduction, Stephen. I sure appreciate that. Um, so I uh, I am a partner with Omaha for Mitchell and King. We opened our doors actually almost a year ago today, January 31st of 2023. Um, and uh, we filed this case, LA Alliance for Human Rights, back in 20, March of 2020, which we all remember March of 2020 quite fondly. Uh, before that, I, I started out my career, I was actually a prosecutor. I worked uh, from, from the criminal division, I jumped over into the constitutional rights section, doing a lot of police work, police defense, 1983 civil rights defense within the LA City Attorney's Office. So I was very familiar with kind of the constitutional issues and all of the um, historical back and forth that went into this. Uh, you know, a lot of the decisions surrounding homelessness in Los Angeles, which is necessarily and, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your take, affected the rest of uh, not just the Ninth Circuit, but the rest of the country. So I left there in 2018 and went into private practice thinking I was going to do sort of like boring, you know, soulless corporate litigation <laughs> for a while to give myself a break. And within about six months, I was approached by this group um, that really for, I mean, for lack of a better word, they were just angry, just really frustrated with the pace of solutions coming out of City Hall 
and coming from the county seat and and watching the city of Los Angeles and the Ninth Circuit and the country respond over and over to these constitutional allegations. And we saw the city of LA, and you can see that this throughout the country, responding in kind of a reactive way. So everybody's homelessness policy became about protecting one's self from litigation. And so we watched the city of LA settle case after case or lose in the Ninth Circuit if they chose to fight it. And um, all of homelessness policy we saw was reactive and not proactive. So they were very frustrated. Um, you know, this was 2018, 2019, and homelessness was just jumping. The number of people in the streets was expanding. Uh, people were permitted at that point to stay all day, tents up. Uh, Skid Row was just blowing up with the number of people. So the people that came to me were largely folks in and around Skid Row. And they were kind of the entire spectrum that you can imagine. It was uh, community members, businesses, property owners, um, service providers. We even had some uh, formerly unhoused individuals at the time just really frustrated and wondering if we could then use the courts in a, in a different way, right? Instead of becoming reactive, to become proactive, right? How can we force courts to move, force uh, um, governments to move instead of just, you know, uh, refraining them from moving? And is there a way to, to use litigation for a positive change instead of just sort of stop arresting people, stop taking property, stop doing this, stop doing that? And so that group ultimately became the LA Alliance for Human Rights, who is my client. Um, uh, it was it turned into an unincorporated association, and then um, at some point, I think maybe a couple years ago, incorporated into a 501c3 and became formalized. And they now have an executive director and staff. And so it's it's kind of positive to see it grow and blossom in that way. But it really just started as a group of average Joe citizens that decided to come together and try to make a change. So at that point, that's maybe fall of 2019, which interestingly is the same time that there was a whole effort to get the Boise versus the city of Idaho case taken up by the, by the Supreme Court. And I actually drafted an amicus on behalf of the International Downtown Association in support of the Supreme Court accepting review of that case. So the, you know, the two efforts certainly overlapped quite a bit. We ended up diving into this and doing months of research and preparation. We ended up, you know, we drafted like a 113 page complaint or something like that. We, we made the rounds talking to all the government officials. Um, ultimately, some of them were interested in jumping in. Some of them were not interested in jumping in and I'll explain what that means in a second. But over the top of this, you have in December of 2019, Supreme Court denied to accept, uh, uh, declined to accept review of the Boise decision. So what that did is it really set Ninth Circuit law firmly in place for us to launch off of that into filing a federal lawsuit on behalf of LA Alliance for Human Rights and multiple individuals uh, to really explain uh, the community's perspective, right, on where all of these various lawsuits and these various settlements have gotten us and to say at this point you have the city and the county of los angeles which is really the epicenter of homelessness in the entire country you have them failing on a constitutional level right i mean you get to a point and i think that this will interest you stephen from a policy perspective of when you have both the uh, legislative and the executive that have failed to correct a, a level that gets to a point of, or excuse me, failed to correct a problem that gets to the point where there are um, constitutional violations that are happening. The only way to kind of course correct that is to go to your third branch of government, which is the judiciary. And so we did. And let me uh, interrupt you just because I think this is where the story gets really interesting. Okay. Because, um, in the Grant's past decision, um, and also in the Martin decision, the Ninth Circuit has emphasized that this is a limited ruling. We are not depriving localities of the tools they need to address street homelessness. 
your organization has been working within the framework laid out by the Ninth Circuit. So to the extent that you guys have been getting anywhere, it seems in a way to strengthen the Ninth Circuit's argument that in fact, there are tools available. So respond to, so finish your story, talk about what you guys did, and then at the end, uh, address what I um, brought up just now. Well, and you're not wrong. I mean, setting up an unfair set of circumstances or unfair parameters doesn't mean you can't still work within those parameters. It just limits what you can do, right? Um, and that was that was kind of our argument, is like, you, you can't do nothing, right? That the option here is no longer to do nothing. And that's what we were seeing. We were seeing a lot of kind of fluttering about uh, you know, everybody was concerned about the next lawsuit that was coming down. And we said, well, no, you're getting all this pressure from over here. We're going to now push back because no longer is the government representing the entire community's interests. So we did. We filed this lawsuit in March of 2020, right before the world shut down. Um, I was like March 10th and we were in a press conference in Midnight Mission, you know, 200 of us in this tiny room. And I'm sure it was the, the original super spreader event. Um, and it really quickly blew up. Judge David Carter, we related this case to one that he had previously done. Uh, and I'll explain that in a second. Uh, but he accepted the case and it really just blew up from there because this man has no uh, patience whatsoever, nor should he. None of us should have patience with the kind of, um, you know, degradation that we're seeing on the streets. And so, you know, what we had seen and we, we kind of uh, modeled our lawsuit around a couple of things. One was, okay, there was this similar litigation down in Orange County. You had an entire, you know, riverbed that had 1,500 individuals camping on the riverbed. And the county of Orange said, we want to uh, we, we wanna, uh, clear out the riverbed and we have to do some environmental remediation. They were sued by a group of activists saying you can't do that. And the ultimate deal that was struck was you must provide shelter and then you clear the riverbed. And that's what they did. And it was very, very successful. It turned the riverbed and it turned the community around, right? It, it provided a place for folks to go that was healthy, that was safe, and it allowed the riverbed to be used by the community again. It was a very successful compromise. And so it ended up being that that case was settled on those same terms. You had 27 other cities down in Orange County kind of jumped in voluntarily, said, I want that deal. I will provide shelter, but I need my communities back. So we said, we want that, and we want it to come to Los Angeles, where at the time we had something like 27,000 unsheltered. Now we've spiked up to 36,000 unsheltered individuals. I mean, people who were actually on the street homeless. Um, and so we filed this uh, under both that context and under the sort of Boise you know, parameters, where we said, okay, look, under Boise, if you don't have shelter, you cannot enforce your quality of life laws. And what that means, there was a whole bunch of debate and there's been various uh, courts that have interpreted it since, but that was, that was the, lands, the legal landscape into which we were stepping. And we said, fine, we might not like it, but if these are the parameters right now, then we will use those parameters and we will say, you must provide shelter and you must enforce the law and you must do that for the good of both the housed and unhoused communities. And that's the confines under which we have acted. Now it's extraordinarily expensive. And I think the, the city of Los Angeles is doing things in ways that I would not do and you probably would not do in, in making it much more expensive. But those are the confines under which we've been operating. And we litigated this case for several years. There was a lot of discussion, a lot of meetings. There was a, a ton of uh, discovery that was done. There was at one point uh, the judge issued a preliminary injunction against the city that was subsequently overturned by the Ninth Circuit because they didn't like the procedural way things were done. Ultimately, in uh, April of, gosh, what is it, 2024? So April of 2022, the city of Los Angeles entered into a settlement agreement with us under those auspices, provide shelter, enforce the law right? 
But we had a third piece to this, which is the services piece. We need mental health. We need drug addiction counseling. We need other services because we want to get people off the street, but we don't want to keep them off the street. That's where the county came in, and we settled with the county just last year. Now, there's an important element to this that I think is crucial in us talking about the Grants Pass and the Boise decision, which was, if you go back to that riverbed I talked about, there were 1,500 people that were living in that riverbed. And Judge Carter ordered the officials to go back, and I don't remember if it was the county of Orange or some city, but ordered them to go, and they all went, and they talked to the individuals who were there. About 300 of them, after all this activity, had migrated. There were only 800 who raised their hand and said, Judge, I want shelter. The remaining ones were either not appropriate for shelter because of their you know, serious mental health issues, because of their serious drug addiction issues. They had some other place to go. Um, perhaps they were had wants or warrants, right? There's some all these other reasons why they didn't want to go into shelter. So as a result, he said, okay, that's about 60%. You build shelter for 60% for everybody who wants it, and you can enforce the law. Now, that was back in 2018, before, uh, I think it was right around the time the original Boise came out, but before uh, the en banc opinion came out and before the Supreme Court declined to review it. So it was the 60% compromise, right? That's what the, all the rest of the cities wanted. I want that 60% compromise with the understanding that as soon as your beds are full, you have nothing else to offer people, you need to stop enforcement. And with all 27 cities, with all the cities at least I have spoken to, not once have they run out of shelter beds in doing the 60% model. They've always had something to offer people. And it's that discount that is somewhat controversial and that is becoming problematic when you look at the way both Boise and Grants Pass are structured. And that's why clarification is needed on that issue. Um, yeah, but it does get it does get complicated. So I think that's yeah. where you want to talk about it. Yeah, I want to get into two concepts. Um, okay. One is what it means for shelter to be available, and yes. what it means for someone to be involuntarily homeless. Um, because a lot of the back and forth in the just Ninth Circuit's jurisprudence between the majority opinion, the dissenters turns on that. But basically, the, the rule, the test that the Ninth Circuit has presented to these cities is that, look, if you, you have too many um, homeless encampments in your community, you want to use law enforcement, you come to me first and tell me if you've made shelter available to the entire um, unsheltered population. If you have enough unsheltered um, – if you have enough shelter beds available to everyone who is involuntarily homeless in your community, then you can go ahead and start enforcing laws and – camping in public parks. But until then, let's talk about how much shelter you have. And crucially, um, that doesn't mean just how many shelters you have in your community. It means how many beds are real, quote, realistically available. Some of the things that come up in these decisions that might make an empty shelter bed not realistically available to someone. If it's run by a faith-based organization, both Boise and Grants Pass have major shelters that are run by a, uh, a mission, a faith-based organization. And I have been studied homeless programs in many communities in America, and it, it, this is very typical that the local gospel mission is the only game in town. I mean, you guys in LA have the URM, you have the Midnight Mission. In most cities, that's all there is. It's not just the biggest shelter, it's, it's all there is. And um, it's a very subtle question, the degree to which they're actually imposing religious requirements. Um, in the ruling in Grants Pass, there is some discussion of what the local gospel mission in Grants Pass does. They claim that you have to go along with some sort of religious requirements that would violate you know, religious liberty law. I don't know. I mean, I've, I've met with many, many gospel rescue missions. I visited them and interviewed them. Everyone I've ever addressed this question to has told me, look, we don't want someone to just fake faith. Like, yes, we want people to accept Jesus Christ as their savior because like for a number of reasons, we want them to do that. But we don't want somebody to just tell us that insincerely because they want benefits. We want it to be sincere. So there's a big difference in 
an organization, a shelter organization being run by a faith-based organization and it imposing some sort of religious requirements. That all, which comes from my experience of like analyzing what homelessness programs look like on the ground, is not addressed at all in this jurisprudence, which to me provides some support for some of the things that the, the uh, dissenters are saying that, in fact, there are real issues with judicial competence and how much judges really understand how a homelessness policy response looks like on the ground. Yeah, no, it is really complicated. Um, and I, you know, there are a couple, there are a couple of these issues um, that I think you raised, but it's not just the, the religious focus. It's the rest of the issues as well, right, that we talk about. So, uh, for example, and we'll put religion aside for the moment, like what if a person, uh, you know, has a disability? A person has a disability and can't go up the stairs, right? Is that available? I think most of us would say it's not available for that person. Well, how far do you want to extrapolate that, right? What if a person has a, a therapy dog and the shelter doesn't accept dogs? Is that available? What if it's a non-registered therapy dog? What if it's just a dog that is a, you know, a close personal uh, support for that person? What if that person has a spouse that they don't want to leave and the only available shelter is for a single individual, right? So you, you can see how you can, it's such a slippery slope and, and where do you draw the line? But certainly the religious aspect is a, a crucial one given the focus of shelters that we see throughout the country. In Los Angeles, you're right, we have a number of faith-based organizations that do beautiful work here, um, and some of them impose certain requirements, and some of them don't impose any requirements. It kind of just depends on, on what this definition of available is. I would be surprised, honestly, Stephen, if the Supreme Court jumps into that. Because it's some of that are details that just have to be litigated and have to be described based on the individual circumstances that are coming into it. But the First Amendment impact on these homeless um, shelters is, is, is a very complicated question. And so if I'm an attorney and I'm advising either a city, a municipality, or I'm advising the individuals, you know, how, how is this going to work? I would probably say, it, you, you know, you can have paraphernalia on the walls, you can have crosses, you can have uh, those kind of things. But if you have any sort of mandatory attendance of religious or mandatory prayer or something like that, attendance of Bible classes, anything like that, you're probably going to be on the other side of the First Amendment on this one. Yeah, sure, sure. And as you alluded to, there are many, many dimensions to the availability question beyond just yeah. the faith-based one. I mean, so, so here's another thing I'm thinking about. Um, time limits. It's very common for shelters to say, look, we'll take you in however you are for 30 days, and then we'll do an assessment. Is this the right program for you or not? Uh, because we want people to be making progress, and if they're making progress, we'll find a way to keep you around. Shelters are fixed space. They have only have so much real estate. You could make the argument that time limits actually expand availability to people who are on a waiting list for shelter who can't get in because they're full. If you say that, no, 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 all, the only available shelter has to be one with no time limits, you're essentially backing into some sort of like housing first argument that only permanent housing ends homelessness, right? Um, there's also this issue of rules. Um, well, people, you know, you've got to be low barrier because if you have any type of sobriety requirement, you will deter people. I've known own shelters that have strict sobriety requirements that on the street have waiting lists because they have a reputation for being really safe, orderly places. And if you rely on those rules, actually, you have to invest less in like security staff. It's just easier to run a place like that. And guess what? A lot There's a lot of demand for places like that on the street. Again, this stuff, which, I, which has just come up in my conversations with people, how to run a shelter program, I don't see reflected at all in the way that the judges are talking about no. you know, whether or not grants passes, shelter system right. passes muster. Because what you're talking about, Stephen, is like a very practical analysis, right? Well, and there's there's the federal law issue here that I don't want to ignore. But you're, what you're talking about is a practical analysis. I don't think you're going to see, I mean, the Ninth Circuit certainly didn't dive into it. We haven't seen, I mean, th these cases haven't been around long enough for us to have enough district court or trial court analysis on it, much less appellate court analysis on it, right? It's only been around, let's see, what is it, 2024, so five years. 
in the timeline of litigation, that's it's, it's an infancy. So you're not going to see any of those kind of practical discussions for I think it, for quite some time. the The bigger problem, I think, honestly, are the federal laws that we have, particularly through HUD, that require the housing first policies to be implicated uh, in order to get any type of federal funding. And that's a different conversation, right? But it's still in unbelievably impactful on policy because if you don't if you're not a low barrier shelter meaning you don't require any type of sobriety to be present um, then you're not going to get any type of of federal funding and in places like Los Angeles where you have the city county state and the federal government all imposing the same requirements of this housing first policy you're not going to get city, county, state, or federal funding. And the only one that we have in Los Angeles that does that right now is Union Rescue Mission. Everyone else has accepted some level of housing first and therefore, um, you know, can get some element of government funding. But it gets very, very complicated when you start looking at the practical implications in addition to the impacts of federal law on all of these things. Okay, yeah. And so one more thing on what you just said before I get into this involuntariness uh, question. Um, getting back to what Grants Pass means for you in your work. One thing that I believe the LA Alliance has been working to um, force the issue of is more investment in temporary housing and away from permanent housing. Permanent supportive housing, the form of housing uh, that's favored by Housing First, certainly favored by HUD, very expensive, takes a long time launch. So if the idea is that you got to give everybody an apartment they can live in for the rest of their life at $800,000 a pop, and, and then you can enforce your laws, you're going to be waiting for a long time. So you guys have been forcing the issue of, no, 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 shelter is an adequate alternative word under investing in shelter. Hasn't there been a way in which the Martin framework has made it easier to make that argument because you're so the, the urgency that the, the specificity of the conditions under which you can enforce the law requires shelter. You've been able to say, look, um, the courts are telling us that we need shelter. We better figure out a way to invest more in shelter, even if that means maybe a little bit less going to PSH. Well, and it's interesting. I don't know that I've ever thought of it from that particular perspective, but I think you're right in that, you know, if if the goal is to enforce laws of some sort, therefore you need to have beds of some sort. And so if you if you need to have beds of some sort, it is not feasible to wait 10 years for $800,000 a door apartment buildings to be available for your entire unsheltered population, which as I said before, is about 36,000 souls on the streets of Los Angeles that are counted as unsheltered. And that's just a rough estimate, right? So that's not, that's not feasible or realistic at all. But I wanna be very careful when we talk about the, the, the enforcement piece of it, because the Alliance is you know, very focused on this you know, humane and humanitarian uh, part of it in that like it this isn't healthy for the unhoused population either right and and there are reasonable confines to society such as you shouldn't be allowed to sleep on the streets right that doesn't mean you just sweep everybody off that doesn't mean you arrest everybody wholesale but it's not healthy for anybody to have human beings living on the streets right and I think we can all acknowledge and appreciate that but I just want to be very careful when we talk about enforcement that we're not advocating for, at least from my, my perspective and for my group, we're not advocating for just arresting everybody, right? That's not the goal. The goal is to do it in a holistic and humane way that's good for everybody. And enforcement has to be part of those tools because that is the only way that you can draw these like reasonable boundaries on society that have to be present in a civilized society for the good of everybody. And so I just want to be super careful when we talk about that. But I think to your point, yes, if the if the argument is you must enforce some laws for the good of everybody, therefore you must have beds. And if you don't have them because you're spending all of your resources on this like ridiculous permanent housing that's taking too long and costing too much, the alternative is, is shelter. And shelter is a good and healthy thing for people, particularly those like most people on the streets, and you know this, Stephen, do not need permanent supportive housing, right? That is that is limited to a very small subset of people, right? 10, maybe 20% of individuals 
on the street who have such severe um, mental health issues or so severely addicted to drugs that it has altered their being or have some type of physical disability that they will forever need permanent support. That's not everybody on the streets. Right, that, like I said, that's maybe 10, 20% of the people. So if you look at it from that perspective, you can say, well, yes, this is what Boise and this is what Grant's past say, is this what we must have, but it's also the right thing to do is to have this temporary interim options so people can go there temporarily and then reintegrate back into normal society in whatever context that looks like for them. Yeah. And as you were talking about just a second ago, we're talking about a mix of response, mix of enforcement and outreach and housing um, responses. Um, But, you know, again, the way that this kind of framework, this test is laid out in these rulings, it's not um, flexible. It's not subtle. It's not, I would say, complicated. It's the shelter comes first. Okay, the available shelter comes first. And then we can talk about the enforcement and um, on the ground, and actually, this is a point that you guys make in your um, amicus brief, which I read, which is that, um, you know, enforcement has to be like right, right mixed in with the offer of shelter sometimes in, in the right type of way and uh, granted the humane way. But still, you know, once one thing that comes up. So if you're investing in shelter, where are these shelters going to go? Are they going to go in somebody's neighborhood? Well, if they're going to go in somebody's neighborhood, there is nearly always some degree of opposition. Now, op, uh, countering that opposition is, is complicated, and maybe some people will just never be reconciled. One thing you can say to people, we're stepping up enforcement. Okay, We're leading with enforcement as well as bringing the shelter into your community. That's I don't think, con- conforms well to the logic of these decisions which say, no, 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 you bring in the shelter, and then we'll talk about whatever enforcement may accompany that. Um, also, if you're leading with the shelter and then the enforcement will come later at, at some point, you know, you, you raise the possibility that you're just going to attract the draw to shelter issue. You're going to attract more homeless people. I understand that that argument is absolutely outrageous to advocates. Or not, nothing makes them more infuriate, infuriated when you say people are choosing to be homeless. Oh, have you ever been to shelter? Who would In New York City right now, the number one homeless, the number one problem in the city is the migrant crisis. And the migrant crisis is understood. Why is, why have, why is New York City attracted so many more migrants than Chicago, Philadelphia? Because New York City has a right to shelter. And word reached the border that you get your own hotel room if you come to. And no one is questioning that that draw to shelter factor has driven the lead issue in the city right now. So it's different in different communities. I'm not saying that's coming to communities throughout the West Coast, but all I'm saying is that human beings respond to incentives. And if the idea is that you just make expansive amounts of shelter available to people and then talk about enforcement because you're then going to contain the homeless problem, there is a realistic possibility that you're not going to contain the homeless problem um, in a way you'll be creating a larger homelessness problem for yourself. I, I actually disagree with the way that you've characterized it, that one has to come in front of the other. I don't think that that's the right way to do it. I think it has to all, they all have to work together, right? So it is difficult when a community is saying, you're going to bring a homeless shelter into my neighborhood. But the the truth is, it's never the shelter itself. That's Nobody cares, for the most part, what happens behind closed doors. It's what happens outside of the door. Right, that's problematic because what happens outside my neighbor's house is what affects me. So if I can be guaranteed in some way that what ha- that that issue is not going to come out that door, then what do I care? It doesn't affect me. It doesn't affect my family, and you know I can stop clutching my pearls quite as much, and I can I can be willing to have that conversation. Right. But the only way you can guarantee that is to say we're going to step up enforcement. It is not. You are not going to have these problems in your neighborhood. We're going to do a better job than we currently are. And in that way you can say, I am bringing things from your front yard into your backyard, right? The NIMBY, not in my backyard. And the only way you do that is if the neighborhood trusts you. And so you you have a push-pull, like things have to happen together. Right? It all has to happen at the same time. And I don't think you can like enforce the law first and just 
what? what do you, like, what does that mean, right? Practically speaking, if we're talking about that, you just arrest everybody and then provide the shelter? Like, none of that's going to work. And so you have to have beds where people go, but in the conversation of getting the community to accept the beds, is this also, you know, concomitant, concomitant um, enforcement that we can do at the same time? But I think there's other options as well. I mean, you have seen really successful... Um, you know, homeless, I was going to say, you know, depends on how you want to characterize it, but really successful homeless pro uh, programs where they create communities, right? You see that in Texas. We've seen it in a couple places in Texas and Austin and in, I want to say, is it Houston or San Antonio? San Antonio. Is the San Antonio, hope, yeah. thank you. Um, you've seen it in a few different places, Seattle. So when you have a community, a separate community in places that are not within a residential area, a residential neighborhood, those tend to be a lot more successful than just sort of throwing it in someone's backyard. So, you know, I have a whole bunch of opinions about where places could go. And in fact, as part of this litigation, we identified like something like 160 acres in the city of Los Angeles that are appropriate at, uh, for these type of projects that are not in residential areas, that are not next to school uh, yards and those kind of things, um, which I'd be happy to share if you'd like to see them, because you can really do this in an effective and efficient way that doesn't get community uh, outrage as long as people believe you when you say this isn't going to come out of the front door. Okay. Let's move into this question of who is involuntarily homeless. Um, yeah. Because this um, and is another th way that the Ninth Circuit says our ruling is very limited, narrow, etc. You know, judges do this all the time. Like, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just a humble judge. I'm enforcing the law. You know, you guys are saying I'm something, saying something ra radical. I'm not. I'm only talking about people who are involuntarily homeless. Someone who has no other choice because they're involuntary. And this, this is what the people who have su sued these cities have said. Uh, is their situation? Um, they need options provided to them by the city. If the city's going to say you can't put up a tent in a park, and you know, one thing that comes up in this litigation is who bears the burden for establishing involuntariness. Um, the Ninth Circuit seems to be satisfied that it's just kind of the declaration of the the individual individual petitioner. Um, the city doesn't really counter that it's, it's fair to say but because they don't know enough about these individual person circumstances it would probably be very difficult for the city to know the individual circumstances of every unsheltered person in their borders um but one thing that i would say that comes up in the data is that frequently in pit counts in west coast cities they do ask people are you from this area um, you know, and it's and now these questions are just you know, it's very superficial information. You know, this is just volunteers out. And so you don't get a lot, but you get something. And it's always at least some people who say, yeah, that, yes, they're recently from they they they're re they recently came here. They're not originally from here. You know, um, they uh, and, and also this comes up in the regional dimension of homelessness debates in um and particularly in California, suburbs and cities are always going back and forth. Oh, you're pushing your homeless population. These aren't ho our homeless people. They're from somewhere else. So it's, I mean, it's, again, it's a kind of word on the street anecdotal thing. Um, but it's not based in nothing, particularly if you're talking about who is really involuntarily homeless, who has no al alternative other than to live in a tent in this particular community. Um, you know, I think you're asking two different questions, at least this is the way I see it, is one is like, who are our homeless and do we have a, an obligation to provide for the entire country's homeless? I mean, that's certainly what Los Angeles asks, right? Because everybody comes here to LA to make it big or because they find out you can camp on the beach and, you know, pitch a tent and nobody cares, whatever it is. Um, so that's that, that's very common in Los Angeles. And do people need to have like a nexus to the city, right? And then the other issue is how does one determine whether a person is voluntarily homeless or not? And those are two different issues. So I'll address the first one first. I think the involuntary homeless is it makes it very complicated. It does. It makes it very complicated because you you if you look at a true analysis, what would it be like? 
Uh, show me all show me all of the money that you have. Let me see your bank account. Do you have a bank account? What's your social security number? I'm going to look up all your benefits, right, to try to determine and try to prove that you in particular, Stephen, could afford a hotel room tonight. And then if you say, no, I'm going to arrest you or whatever. That's a very impractical way to think about it from a city perspective, right? When you have, like, beat cops who are walking around or trying to, you know, figure out what's going on with a whole group of people that are in a park, they're obviously not going to do that level of investigation. And it's impractical, even for the smallest of communities, much less a place like Los Angeles. So that perspective, I think, is unreasonable. I do think the perspective and the one that we have always advocated for is to say, we have a place for you to go, right? You have a shelter. It might not be what you love. It might not be a hotel room, but it is a bed if you would like it. And if you decline it, then you are involuntarily homeless. And you saw that in a bunch of litigation that we recently saw coming out of San Francisco, if you've been following that, um, which I have been pretty closely, you have a magistrate who told the city of San Francisco they could no longer enforce their laws because they were arresting people who were not involuntarily homeless and, or, or they were arresting people who were involuntarily homeless, right? And so there, it went up to the Ninth Circuit. The Ninth Circuit kicked it back down. There's been, you know, kind of a back and forth going on. But it is it is very interesting in the way they define involuntarily homeless. And I think that's the way that we approach it. And, and, and not from a, do you have enough beds for your entire involuntarily homeless population? Because I just don't think there's, there's just no way to know. However... If you look at it from the 60% perspective that I talked about earlier, where you have a sort of a microcosm, right? These 1,500 people living in the in the riverbed and 800 of them ultimately wanted and, and took shelter. And then you extrapolate them to the 27 other cities. And I think it's up now because we've had a couple more that have jumped in. But, and, and every single instance showed that 60% was roughly the right marker Maybe that's something that people can use. I don't know if the Ninth Circuit would accept that or not. I've got no idea. This has never been challenged to the Ninth Circuit. But it's certainly not 100%. There's, I don't think there's a single person out there that would say it's 100%. But the problem is you have cities that are trying to look at it from a very practical point of view, like city managers, like what do I take from Boise? What do I take from Grants Pass? How do I apply that here? When I'm a small city and I have maybe 100 people what do I have to just tell me what I have to do, judge, right? And it makes it very difficult to say. Do I have to go interview every single person and see if they would accept a shelter? Well, that sometimes is very different when rubber meets the road and I have something to offer them and then they say no. I mean, it's just like this whole somewhat quagmire unworkable solution, which is why we've adopted the 60% method, but it's far from being precise. Yeah, and you know, Grants Pass I think is about forty thousand people. Um, you know, so it's a pretty small city, um, and uh, the way that the law is framed in these rulings is that you're really talking about this particular city's situation, the people who are in this city, the system that responds to them. Um, the federal program, the Continuum of Care program, that really is more of a regional approach like we we want to we want to develop regional homeless services systems that's the way that the federal system is set up it's not just individual 40,000 city person cities so there is a kind of um discordance between the way that the federal program is set up this that structure um and the way that the um the ninth circuit conceives of things in these rulings i mean 40 to say that 40,000 you know you're just supposed to set things up and whatever to act like it's it's just a very static way to look at a um i think kind of dynamic situation it is it's too static it's too static and i think everybody acknowledges that but there has to be some type of metric because the idea that you have to have 100 percent of the beds for 100 percent of the people is just unworkable especially they have to be not just any beds right they have to be practically available and they can't be you know violative of the first amendment and then you have all these other issues. Well, what about spouses? What about dogs? What about whatever? And so it, it makes it so practically unworkable that I think it has really frozen a lot of cities in the Ninth Circuit and, and frankly, elsewhere, because where goes the Ninth Circuit, there goes the rest of the country. God help you. And so people are very concerned to do anything affirmative because they're afraid of a lawsuit because of how unworkable 
and kind of opaque these instructions have become uh, for, that have come out. Like, uh, unfortunately, all of the district courts and now the appellate courts that have considered this Boise new rule, this like Eighth Amendment issue, which has never been an Eighth Amendment issue before, um, those cases have only operated to further confuse the issue rather than clarify the issue. And I think that's one of the primary reasons that we were supporting taking this up on appeal, even though for, honestly, for political reasons, there may be some reasons that the Alliance does not want it to get overturned, and we can talk about that in a minute, but because it has become so unworkable and things have just only become further muddled as the new courts have addressed it, it it's just a very difficult, you know, it's, it's difficult from a practical perspective to try to figure out where one goes in that circumstance. Well, I've been following what you're saying about about the 60 percent rule as developed with this from the Santa Ana Riverbed situation. And it does strike me as more reasonable than the one that comes out of them. Why do we need a rule at all, though? Why can't we say that local democracy can sort this out? I mean, I haven't read all of the briefs filed by people like Gavin and Governor Newsom and all the other local officials who were just desperately petitioning the Supreme Court to take this up, um, isn't it their kind of expectation that the Supreme Court is not going to craft a new rule, um, but that they're going to say that actually the local democracy can be trusted to manage this? I mean, you know, so one argument you might make on behalf of local democracy is that because uh, California does so much things through ballot initiative, very, very often when voters have been presented with the question, do you want to tax yourself to raise money to spend on homelessness programs? They have said yes. I don't know. Will the if they will say yes forever, they've said yes a lot. I think they'll say yes again. So the idea that this would be a you know really cruel, um, unacceptable system without a fixed rule, that that's such a great risk that we really need very specific judicial oversight. You know, I'm not sure that's wholly persuasive. Yeah, I mean, yes and no. I have to say, Stephen, I, I think on the one hand, you have, I think that local democracy has shown itself unable to deal with this. And I think that's the problem. I think that's the fundamental problem, is that local democracy has failed. I mean, that's what the LA Alliance case was all about, is that put Boise, put Grants Pass aside, local democracy has failed to solve this problem on a constitutional level, right? There, there are people dying, quite literally. There are fires, there are attacks, there's violence, there's, I mean, the number of things. And I'm, I'm talking about both on and by homeless people, so I don't want to be interpreted as like blaming home, the homeless folks. I mean, certainly there is a criminal element there that needs to be addressed. But I think separate and apart, that's, that's been our issue for a long time, is at least here in Los Angeles, you have a failure to deal with this issue adequately, which is why judicial supervision is necessary and why we sued in the first place. Now, my biggest concern, <laughs> and I, you know, I hesitate to even say this because it's, there's a real internal confliction because you, you have something like this legal issue. This maybe this this sort of esoteric legal issue that I don't know if policy folks care that much about, but whether the eighth amendment, this cruel and unusual punishment provision applies post conviction or pre conviction, right? It had always been thought to be a post-conviction remedy, right? So after a person is, con is convicted, they cannot be cruelly and usually punished, meaning, you know, jaywalking and you get thrown in jail for 50 years or whatever. That's a cruel and unusual punishment. But here it's being used as a pre-conviction issue. And that, so from a legal perspective, I, you know, that's offensive to me. That's not, that is, I, I've always been taught and I agree and I think it makes the most sense to think of the Eighth Amendment as a post-conviction remedy for all sorts of various reasons that I won't get into. The concern that I have from a political perspective is if a um, grants pass is overturned in a sweeping manner, meaning that this is completely the wrong analysis by the Ninth Circuit and there is no such Eighth Amendment post-conviction, you know, Eighth Amendment remedy remedy for these issues. And if we kind of go back to the, those that era pre-Boise, right, so pre-2018, 
what does that mean practically for places like Los Angeles and Seattle and San Francisco? And the, what that practically means is there are going to be a lot of other smaller cities that are just going to start sweeping people off their streets that are going to start, I mean, if they don't already, right? But a lot of folks, I don't have to offer shelter. I don't have to do anything. Just get off of my streets. You're not welcome here any longer. Kind of the more conservative places. And though folks are going to flood into Los Angeles, into San Francisco, into Portland, into Seattle, in places that, you know, from a political perspective, aren't going to do that. I'm not going to just arrest people without offers of shelter. Um, and frankly, I don't, I don't think from a humanitarian perspective that makes a lot of sense, right? We're just arresting a person when they have no place to go functionally, if they are, as we say, involuntarily homeless, what is that going to do? You're just going to arrest them, they're going to get booked, and they're going to get released. And how is that benefiting anybody? So, um, you know, there there is some concern from a political perspective that Los Angeles will be particularly impacted. And just from my client's perspective, uh, that's a, a little bit of a concern. So there's, you know, there are certainly, I think, nuances to this conversation that are to be had. But I think, Stephen, your response to that would be, then that's a democratic issue, right? Well, that's, a that's a political issue and not a legal issue, and one needs to stay in one's lane, perhaps. Uh, that's not my only response. Okay. My <laughs> other response is I don't believe the whack-a-mole argument. I don't think that breaking up big encampments or enforcing law in one community and not as much in another community uh, keeps it, it, that it's a fixed uh, number that you just shift the population down, I think consistent enforcement actually reduces the number on net. Like, yes, there is some degree of dispersion that already goes down, but consistent enforcement reduces on net the amount of street homelessness you have. But I, I, I want to dwell on this particular issue because I want to devote the rest of um, the time we have left to gaming out a reversal, if a reversal is coming. So just, well, first of all, let me just ask you that. Is it realistic to think of a reversal? And also, would a reversal meet, is there a modest way to do it? Would it necessarily mean um, uh, uh, completely scrapping Martin as well? Um, what might this look like? You know, it's so fascinating because I have thought of this dozens of times, Stephen, and I don't have an answer. Honestly, I think if a reversal is coming, I think it's a complete scrapping of Martin. I don't know how one does this in a more nuanced way. I think if the Supreme Court overturns it, I think it is a, you know, Eighth Amendment is a post-conviction remedy, not a pre-conviction remedy, and therefore this is not, a, you know, not applicable. Now, I don't know that the, the Supreme Court can do that, without addressing the slightly more nuanced issues of like there have been times when the Eighth Amendment has been used as a pre-conviction issue. So for example, criminalizing like being an alcoholic, All right? That's criminalizing the act of being, which is, has been, you know, um, has been, has been used by the, by the Supreme Court as a pre-conviction remedy. You cannot criminalize the act of being, but the problem is that you have grants passed and Yes, yes, active, thank you. Um, you have grants passed in Boise that took it a step further and say, by arresting non, you know, involuntarily homeless individuals, you are criminalizing the, the status and not necessarily the action. And I think that there's a, there's a way to negotiate that that is more nuanced than just scrapping the entire Eighth Amendment analysis altogether that I would hope that the Supreme Court would take up which is the differentiation between behavior and status. Because there are behaviors that can be regulated without regulating status. So for example, you know, quality of life issues like eliminating, you know, one's bodily functions in public, right? Really big issue. The argument would be if a person doesn't have a place to go, you can't criminalize that. Right? That's the argument. That's a sort of like the extrapolation argument. And so you can say, well, no, that's an action. And the action can be regulated. And it can be regulated in a more nuanced way by the local governments who have more of a control and more of an understanding of what its own communities need. And I think that's probably the way that I would hope that the overturn would go. Yeah, one of the dissenters really focuses on that issue. Like, where does this end? If we're if the saying that all involuntary c conduct cannot be 
um, you know, criminalize yet yeah, uh, urination, defecation. I mean, maybe even sexual relations in public, substance abuse. You know, maybe you just can't. It's something that someone can't help. They've got to do it. They've nowhere else to live. Th- there's a uh, the uh, ad- biological is used by the um, Ninth Circuit in the majority opinion talking about sleeping. Look, it's a, just a biological. Nece- there are a lot of things that are biological necessities that we want to be able to regulate. And where you know where does this lead? But also just where does this lead in terms of um, the larger context? So, you know, you've got all kinds of other things that happened over the last 10, 15 years in California. Um, Legal, you know, Prop 47, you still have the all the restrictions on civil commitment that have always been there. Um, You have a a really kind of revolution in policing norms in terms of what police departments are expected. Just a real incoherence is what do we want police in the criminal justice system to do? Vis-a-vis social policy question. Do we want to be involved, not involved? They don't know what they're doing. It's just a muddle. And actually, this is something that the ninth, the majority uh, emphasizes that, look, we are, Boise didn't create homelessness. Homelessness was around before. It will still be around. Um, um, it's uh, a real question, you know, what exactly this will allow local governments to do and what way this could make things better. Um, I would say before letting you get into that, I do think there's an advantage of not – uh, letting uh, local officials hide behind courts as much like this. There will be a benefit for accountability saying like, no, no, you can't say your hands are tied like you have been in recent years. We want you to at least try to do something. Um, I think that would be um, at least a modest benefit. No, I think so. I think so, too. I think I think just kind of unshackling. Right. If we can think of it that way, unshackling and trusting our local governments to act in ways that are necessary and responsive to their own communities. Now, I say that as someone who has recently sued our local government for not being responsive, and so it makes it a very difficult argument to make, right? And I and I do want to be very clear, all opinions are my own, right? I'm not giving anybody legal advice herein, and, and so uh, don't come after me for that. But I do think that the unshackling is, is incredibly important, and particularly when you layer on top all the difficulties that you just ma- you just mentioned, Stephen, the Prop 47, right, the near near decriminalizing of narcotics in Los Angeles, not just in Los Angeles, but in California. You have police reform. You have the inability um, to to involuntarily treat a, an individual who needs treatment for uh, serious mental health issues. And so you have all these like layered complications on top of it. But I like to think of this, and I explain this to people, as ever, you know, when you start thinking that way and you start thinking so grand, it feels so overwhelming. How do we address these issues? And particularly when you come down to the local government level on a smaller place that's not Los Angeles, that has a little bit more resources. But had, had, what I just want to get my, I just want to get folks help or I want to get them off of the street and my constituents off my back. What do I do? And I think what I always say is it's like an onion, right? You layer on all these problems and the homeless population is not, um, you know, monolithic. There's, there's, so you have to just peel one onion at a time, but you kind of do it at this all at the same time, right? So you first offer people shelter or a place to go or something from a local government perspective, and that will take off the involuntarily homeless population. Then you have the mental health population that you have to deal with. Then you have the criminal elements you have to deal with. But if you just lay it all in and do nothing, all it does is get worse and get worse and get worse. And I think to your point, Stephen, that was your whole like whack-a-mole argument of the answer is never to do nothing and consistent touches does reduce homelessness. I don't know. I just addressed a whole lot of issues there, but uh, maybe there's something in there that makes sense. I think there's a lot in there. Let me, okay. and we're almost done, but let me just ask you one last question, uh, more generally about what it means to have lawyers like yourself and judges so deeply involved in social policy. I mean, first of all, let me make clear, there's no getting around that we're going to probably have lawyers and judges involved in homeless policy for a long time. They've been, long been involved. It's an interesting development that not everybody doing public interest law is not a, a prog- far left progressive. That's a more recent development and makes things interesting. Um, but it, in a way, it's also very depressing uh, from a kind of just democratic perspective. I mean, America is a very low trust uh, country. 
Um, and it seems like our trust in our institutions, our, our officials, each other just keeps going down. And one thing that happens when you have less trust but you still need something done is you turn to the legal system because there is a way in which you can make that work in a way that if you just can't trust other processes. Um, and it's it's never it just it has to be done. There, there are compelling reasons for it. Um, but there can be a risk that it actually um, exacerbates um, that low trust because it makes it so that you can only work through these very formal processes and you can't get back to a more kind of civil, informal way of sorting through these things. It may be just completely nostalgic or romantic to think that we, we could get back there. Um, but I am concerned that, you know, relying so much, you know, the other team did it. No, this team does it. I mean, that everybody's placing so much focus on the legal system that these, you know, larger issues of, of civics, trust, which go way beyond just homelessness, um, you know, do, do get kind of exacerbated. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting, it's an interesting point and an interesting thought. And I think you're probably right about that. I think there is probably an exacerbation, but I don't know if it is a cause of the exacerbation or as a result of the exacerbation, right? Maybe there's a little bit of a chicken and an egg argument there. But I think the, again, if you look at it from a practical perspective, what's the alternative, right? And I think, unfortunately, the alternative is for the non-activist community, the non far left uh, progressive community in which I do not reside um, is, is to do for a long time it was to do nothing and trust our governments right and unfortunately that trust is eroded so long because the that community has used the court so successfully to change and alter policy that it's now gotten to the point where you need a another voice you know, speaking into the government and pushing the government in particular ways that, um, you know, maybe that voice didn't need to be heard previously. I'm going to let you have the last word. Liz Mitchell, thank you so much for coming on Manhattan Insights, a Manhattan Institute production. My name is Stephen Eid, Senior Fellow at the Manhattan Institute. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in, and we hope you enjoyed the conversation. If you did like what you heard on the podcast, please consider giving us five stars and writing a review on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, or wherever you listen. And be sure to check out future episodes of Manhattan Insights.